very warm welcome to our service on the 10th of January 2021. I greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus from Table Baptist Church in Clantrescent, South Wales. Today we're going to return to the Gospel of Luke. Before lockdown we were studying Luke and we came to chapter 10. Then in the middle of lockdown I dipped into chapter 10 and we looked at the Good Samaritan, the parable, parable of the Good Samaritan, and we looked at the incident of Mary and Martha where Mary sat at the Lord's feet whilst Martha was busy serving. So in the middle of our Ten Commandments series we broke into Luke chapter 10 considering love for God, Mary sitting at Jesus' feet, love for our neighbour, the parable of the Good Samaritan. But now I want to return to Luke's Gospel and go through it over the next three, few months, God willing, beginning in chapter 11. And this chapter is very suitable for us. It begins with the Lord's Prayer. It goes on giving a parable about prayer. Jesus talks about a friend coming at midnight, a parable all about prayer. And then it comes to that famous passage about asking, seeking and knocking. So we going to look at the whole matter of prayer over the next few weeks. And our focus midweeks also is prayer. Howard will be bringing a message to us on prayer this Wednesday. And I think that's so necessary for us. I don't know how you're feeling. Are the hands hanging down? Do you feel limp? Do you feel weak at the knees? Are you discouraged? Are you struggling? Is there a need to strengthen your hands, to lift up holy hands in prayer before God? In January, as a church, we normally begin the month with prayer, and so it's good to focus on this subject to encourage us to be a people of prayer. So please would you turn with me to Luke chapter 11, reading verses 1 to 13. Luke chapter 11. Now it came to pass, as he, Jesus, was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, the one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. So he said to them, when you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And he said to them, Which if you shall have a friend, and go to him at midnight, and say to him, Friends, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, and say, Do not trouble me, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, yet, because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives and he who seeks finds and to him who knocks it will be opened if a son asks for bread from any father among you will he give him a stone or if he asks for a fish will he give him a serpent instead of a fish or if he asks for an egg will he offer him a scorpion if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children how much more Will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? We thank God for the reading of his word. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting Father, we thank you for the reading of your precious word. We thank you for the teaching of our Lord Jesus on prayer. And, O oh God, as we come to you, we do say, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Our desire is that your name would be glorified in all the earth. Our desire is that your name would be sanctified and set apart by men and women, that we would truly honour you. 
We love you because you have first loved us. We love you, Heavenly Father, because you have adopted us into your family and made us your very own. We thank you for your holiness and your purity. We thank you that we can turn from our sullied hearts and from this wicked, sinful world, and we can look into the God who is light, in whom there is no darkness at all. We praise you, O Lord, for the beauty of your holiness. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you're a God of infinite wisdom. Lord, your thoughts are far above our thoughts. Your ways are far beyond our ways. Lord, your wisdom is inscrutable. It is past finding out. And yet, O oh God, we thank you that you have left us with the revelation of your word and have given us your Holy Spirit. And as the Lord Jesus exhorted us, we pray, O oh God, that you would give us more of the Spirit, that you would enlighten our minds. Lord, grant more of the gracious influence of the Holy Spirit to understand the Scriptures. We pray that we might truly understand your will as revealed in the pages of Scripture. Father, as we come to you, we pray too that your kingdom might come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, extend your kingdom here upon the earth. Raise up workers for the harvest field and glorify your name. And may each of us, Lord, be well, willing and ready to do those things that you call us to do. Help us to obey your moral commands. Help us, O oh Lord, to follow your dictates. Teach us your statutes, Lord, and give us obedient hearts. And O oh God in heaven, how we are in need of daily provision. Provide for us. Lord, individually, as families and as a church. Provide, Lord, for those members of our family who maybe are struggling. Lord, give us our daily bread, we pray. We do not want to take things for granted. You have provided homes for us. You have provided incomes for us. You have provided clothes. You have provided food. We live in a wealthy land. Lord, you have been so gracious to us. But to whom much is given, much shall be required. So, Lord, help us to give. Our right hand, not knowing what our left hand is doing, help us to give freely, for freely we have received from you. O oh God in heaven, we pray too that you'd forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Grant that there would be no barrier in our heart towards anyone, no grudge, no ill thoughts, but, O oh Father, that as you have forgiven us in Christ, so also we ought to forgive one another. You have said that if we do not forgive, our Father in heaven will not forgive us. So, Lord, as we consider uh, those who we have had hurts and difficulties with this morning, we pray, O oh Lord, that you would forgive us and forgive them. And Father, lead us not into temptation. Lord, we are weak. We know that if we think we stand, we will fall. Lord, do not lead us into that place of temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And so we say, yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, we're looking at this all-important matter of prayer. The disciples said to Jesus, teach us to pray. Now, why did they say that? They may have said, Lord, teach us more truth. They may have said, give us another sermon. They may have said, teach us to love our enemies. Teach us, Lord, to forgive others. But they, having seen Jesus in prayer and watched him, asked that they would know how to pray. Lord, teach us how to pray as John the Baptist taught his disciples. They were confessing, really, an inability, a weakness and an ignorance in this area. I wonder about you and I, do we see the need to ask God to teach us to pray? Do you find difficulties in prayer? The hymnist says this, what various hindrances we meet when coming to the mercy seat, but he who knows the worth of prayer wishes to be often there. I think you would agree with the hymnist that prayer isn't easy. There are often many hindrances, the hindrances of our flesh. We feel sluggish, we feel tired. We have other things that we must do. There are hindrances that come from the devil. He doesn't want us to pray. 
He'll put barriers in our way. When Paul and Silas were off to a prayer meeting, the devil sent a young fortune teller behind them seeking to disturb their peace so that they wouldn't go to the place of prayer. Prayer isn't easy. We find reading of the Bible much easier than prayer. We find giving to the Lord's work easier than prayer. Serving easier than prayer. And certainly we find talking to other people easier than talking to God. Why is this? Do we not find delight in God's presence? Do we not find joy in communing with him? Well, it's because as Christians, we have a war on the spirit, wars against the flesh, and the flesh against the spirit is a battle. And there needs to be self-discipline. We need to take time out. We need to not let all sorts of other thoughts invade our minds, but ask for God's grace to come in the name of Jesus to him, to remind ourselves of the wonderful privilege that we have. We are all priests. We are a royal priesthood and we have immediate access into the Holy of Holies. There is a new and living way that has been opened up to us through the blood of Christ. And so he says, come. Oh, that we would take every advantage of prayer in the new year. If God stirs you to prayer, then pray, because prayer isn't easy. Discipline yourself each day to seek God in prayer. Perhaps go out for a walk and pray. Perhaps go to a certain place in your house and make sure you're alone where there are no disturbances. Turning off your mobile phone, keeping away from the computer and the television. Seek God's face in prayer. Well, today we're going to look at two things. First of all, prayer in the life of the Lord Jesus. And secondly, praying for God's glory. We're going to consider the first half of the Lord's Prayer, that which we call the Lord's Prayer, praying for his glory. But first of all, let's consider in general prayer in the life of the Lord Jesus. Now, Luke, the author of his gospel, emphasises the humanity of the Lord Jesus. He is the Son of God, but he's also the Son of Man. He emphasises that he could get weary, thirsty, tired. He emphasises his humanity. And there's a great emphasis in Luke's Gospel on the prayer life of the Lord Jesus. Jesus was both God and man. And as man, he depended upon his heavenly Father in prayer. He needed the Spirit. The Spirit came upon him and enabled him as a human being. There's a great mystery in this. He had two natures, a divine nature and a human nature, distinct yet joined in one person. And as a man, he was dependent upon his Father in heaven. And as God, he enjoyed communion with his Father. But when we consider his prayer life, I believe we're considering more the human aspect of that one person. He'd take upon, taken upon himself humanity, and yet without its fallenness. Now, Luke's Gospel re records the, re the withdrawal of our Lord Jesus Christ into the desert, into the wilderness. The Lord Jesus would often take time out. He'd had the crowds around him all day. He'd ministered to them. He'd healed them. He'd taught them. And sometimes he would get up very early. He would go to a lone place to pray. On other occasions, he would go to a mountain to pray sometimes all night. Do you remember that occasion when he'd been teaching the 5,000 and he'd fed them? And then he sent his disciples on across the lake without him. He went up a mountain to pray. He prayed all night. And in the fourth watch of the night, that was the early hours of the next day, he then walked upon the water to meet his disciples. Jesus prayed often. Of course, he prayed continually throughout the day. He would have known communion with his father, but he saw those needs as a human being to pray extensively. 
to seek his father's face. Now once when he went up a mountain, he took Peter, James and John with him. And we read this, as he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered and his robe became glistening and white. As he was in communion with his father in heaven, his father pulled back the curtain and Peter, James and John were able to see something of his glory. We remember Moses of old when he went up into the presence of God again in a mountain and he spoke to God as a friend, speak to his friends face to face. There was Moses speaking to God through the mediator, the Lord Jesus, face to face with God, with the Son of God. And when he descended, that communion that he had, it affected his very appearance, his face shone, the reflected glory of God. Now the greater than Moses, the very Son of God, was upon a mountain. And Peter, James and John were given a glimpse of his glory as his face shone and his clothes became glistening white. Moses enjoyed the reflected glory. Jesus so showed something of his innate glory. Friends, communion with God is sanctifying. Godly desires are satisfied. When a person beholds their God, it affects them. Rarely, we would say, it would affect their physical appearance, but it was said of Robbie Mur Robert Murray McShane, that great Scottish preacher, that when he preached, it was as if his face shone with the love of God. He was only a young man in his 20s, but his communion with the Lord seemed to have affected his very appearance. Now, friends, if Jesus spent much time in prayer. How much more do you and I need to spend time in prayer? The disciples said, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. The disciples of John the Baptist needed to understand what prayer was all about. He was a man who spent much time in the wilderness in communion with God. They wanted to learn from him. So did the disciples of the Lord Jesus. And how did Jesus respond? Well, he responded by saying, when you pray, you need to understand how to pray. You need to remember your relationship with God, that he is your father. You need to seek first his glory. Hallowed be your name. You need to understand how to pray. Seek God first, then talk about your needs. And we are given in Luke 11 and Matthew 6, an outline of what true prayer should contain, a pattern for our praying. We can pray this prayer word for word if we mean it from our heart, together in churches or individually at home. We can use it as a structure and a basis for our praying. The Lord Jesus gave them this prayer as a model for them. But he also gave instruction on the manner in which we're to pray, the fervency, the persistency, the expectation, the faith that's needed in prayer. In Luke's gospel, we have various parables. We have that parable that we read. Here's a man, he goes to his friend at midnight, he's needing bread because a visitor's come. His friend, won't, his friend will not open the door just because he's a friend, but he'll open the door because he keeps knocking, he keeps persisting. So Jesus says, so you must keep praying, persisting. Answers to prayer don't just come like that, willy-nilly, easily. Show your desire, keep coming. And then we have in Luke 18, the parable of the persistent widow. Jesus said men ought always to pray and not get discouraged. Remember that persistent widow in, her par in the parable that Jesus gave. She went to the unjust judge, she kept going until she got what she desired. Jesus gave another parable on prayer in Luke's gospel. Luke speaks an awful lot about the prayer life of Jesus and the teaching that Jesus gave on prayer. Two men went up to the temple, one a Pharisee. He prayed like this, I thank you, Lord, that I am not like other men, 
another man came up to the temple. Two men, the Pharisee standing at the front, the tax collector at the back. He beat upon his breast. That's how he prayed. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus said, that's how you're to pray. Humbly, confessing, not proud, not thinking of what others are thinking about your prayers. One went home at peace with God. One sadly remained in his sin. So then, friends, what does Luke's gospel tell us about Jesus and his life of prayer? It tells us that as a man, he sought the face of his father. He enjoyed communion with him when he was to make important decisions like choosing the 12 apostles. He prayed first. He encouraged his disciples to pray with him. Remember on another occasion, he took Peter, James and John with him to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane. Sadly, they failed. We need to learn that prayer is essential in our lives. We need to make it a priority. We need to ask for grace to be disciplined in this area and to know the joy of praying to God. But secondly, let's now begin to consider the Lord's Prayer. And as I said, we're looking at the first half of it, which is verse 2 in Luke 11. And we're going to see how this prayer can be split in two. The first half is towards God. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. And then the second half is to do with us. Forgive us our sins. Lord, lead us not into temptation. Lord, provide for us. Give us day by day our daily bread. So today we're just going to look at the first half, which is the Godward part. But before we do that, notice this, that Jesus said, when you pray, verse 2. Not if you pray, but when you pray. God's children pray. Those who are born again, those who are regenerate, pray. When the Apostle Paul was converted, the first thing that was said about him was this, behold, he prays. Prayer is a sign, or one of the signs that a person is converted. Before, there was no desire to pray to God. Yes, because we're made in God's image and eternity is in our hearts. In situations of desperation, men will call out to God and to pray. Or if we belong to a religious institution, we pray the formal set prayers of that church or that religious institution. But it's not natural for men to talk to God and to seek him and to enjoy communion with him. Men do not normally pray, but when a person's converted, there are desires, desires for God, desires to speak to him. And Jesus says, when you pray in this way, pray. So I want to ask you, first of all, do you pray? Do you find in your hearts those desires to pray? It may be difficult, but you find you turn to the Lord so often. Yes, sometimes you regret that you've stayed so long without asking him about something, but you do come to him. When you pray, Jesus said. And then he said, before we look at the three petitions, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. Three petitions about, first of all, his name, secondly, his kingdom, thirdly, his will. But before we consider that, let's consider how Jesus said we ought to pray, our Father who is in heaven. For the Jew, this was astounding. In Old Testament days, nobody really addressed God as Father. They knew him as Jehovah, but his name was so holy and pure they wouldn't pronounce the word Jehovah. But they wouldn't come to him as Father. Yes, Revelation is progressive. And yes, many of them knew, those who were born again, an intimacy with God. He wasn't a far-off God. 
They knew him, they were his children. They were regenerate, just like New Testament believers. But they hadn't understood the fullness of the character of God. Psalm 103 talked about God who, who's, who's a father, pities his children, but they, they hadn't learned to address him in that way. But Jesus says to his disciples, you have the spirit of adoption. You pray in this way, our Father who is in heaven. Now, not all people can pray in that way or should pray in that way because not all people have God as their Father. Until you've come to Christ and believed in him, until you've repented of your sins and become a Christian, until Jesus has become your Lord and your Master, you are not in the family of God. You're still outside in the cold, in the dark. But when you turn to Christ, you discover that you've been adopted into the family of God and God is your father and you're to call upon him as your father. When you pray, how do you pray? Well, it's good to remind yourself of all the characteristics of God. He's eternal, he's all wise, he's omnipotent. But perhaps the first thing that we ought to do in our prayers is this, is remember that he is our heavenly father and address him as such. There's intimacy there, Papa, Father. But there's also reverence there, our Father who is in heaven. But notice also, Jesus said this, when you pray, do not say my Father, but say our Father. Was he saying that just to his disciples in terms of their corporate praying? No. He meant also on your own. Remember that you're part of a body. You're part of the family of God. Remember your other brothers and sisters. Pray on their behalf. Of course, it's not wrong to pray individually. We must do. The psalmist did. Jesus did. Paul did. We can pray about to God personally. I, me, my. But you know, the better way to pray, the more fuller way to pray, is to include others in your prayers. And to pray to our Father. He's not just my Father. He's a Father of all his people. I'm not just concerned about me and my prayer life and my walk. I'm concerned about God and his glory and his church and his people. So when you pray, pray our Father who is in heaven. And then let's look at these three petitions in turn. First of all, hallowed be your name. Now we've said that the Jews had a great reverence for the name of God. They wouldn't pronounce his name. What do we say about the name of God? Well, the psalmist says this, give to the Lord the glory due his name. In prayer we are to realise how small we are, how sinful we are, we're not to rush into prayer and be informal. We're to put a hand upon our mouth and to, to be quiet before the Almighty God. Hallowed, may your name be sanctified. Lord, your name is being treated as dirt in this world. Your name is blasphemed. And Lord, I, I can take your name in vain. Lord, hallowed be your name in my life, in the life of my brothers and sisters, may your name be honoured and glorified. So that's one way in which we pray. But we also recognise that the name of God means the character of God, the attributes of God. Jesus said this, he said in his prayer to his Father, I have manifested your name to those whom you have given me. Jesus was saying, I have manifested your character. I've shown who you are. I've revealed your attributes. I've manifested your name to those whom you have given me. So when we pray, hallowed be your name, we're saying, Lord, may your name be hallowed, sanctified, set apart. May we extol your very character and glory in you and adore you. May we be taken up with your love. May we meditate upon that in all of its wonderful facets lord may we be taken up with a wonderful truth that you are absolute truth 
the veracity of God in all of his word. May we be taken up with every attribute that you are, your goodness, your kindness, your patience, your mercy, the fact that you're a just God, angry against sin, a righteous God, hallowed be your name may you be extolled in our lives and you may you be enjoyed and glorified as we worship you i think when jesus said hallowed be your name he's calling his people to rejoice in god for who he is but he's also calling his people to have that desire in their hearts that throughout the world in their own lives and in the life of the church of God's people that the name of God will be uttermost that it will be honored and glorified so my friend when you think of the name of God and you think of that friend of that that phrase hallowed be thy name consider all that God is reverence him come before him but then next the next petition your kingdom come now over christmas we thought of jesus being born as king and we considered something of his kingdom you see jesus had inaugurated a kingdom when he came to this earth he would tell men and women repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand and then he would say if i by um, the finger of god cast out demons you know that the kingdom of God has come amongst you. Jesus taught that his kingdom had come. The reign of God upon the earth in the hearts of all who believed in him was being established. Men and women were pressing into that kingdom through repentance and faith. His kingdom had come. And so why does Jesus ask his disciples to pray in this way? Thy kingdom come if it already has come well the kingdom of car is come is coming and will come you see the kingdom of god is about the expansion of god's rule here upon the earth in the hearts of his people so when we pray your kingdom come we're praying for conversions we're praying that he will extend his rule it has come it is coming but we're also praying that it will come in all of its fullness when christ comes again and reigns upon the earth that his kingdom will come and of all of his glory and majesty. The Bible says that one day the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. Is that not your longing? Do you long for the day when Christ will come again, when he will present the kingdom to his Father, when he will be all in all? When every now knee shall bow before him, so we pray your kingdom come. What does that mean for our prayer meetings? Well, it means many things. It means that we should be praying for conversions. Apostle Paul prayed regularly that his fellow brethren would be saved. It means that we should pray that God will be raising up workers for his harvest field just as jesus taught us to pray pray the lord of the harvest that he would send out workers that means people dedicated full-time to gospel ministry pray that he'll raise up workers for his harvest field how does the lord answer those prayers in the emw magazine the last edition Errol Davis has an article of a little church that prays specifically for members in the community to be saved over a three-year period. And wonderfully, God heard their prayers. As we pray, we need to be willing to be instruments used by God. If we're praying, Lord, your kingdom come, we're saying, Lord, use us in the extension of your kingdom. Now, God works on his own timescale when he will how he will, through whom he will, and in he will. I'm sure you've found this, haven't you? If we've prayed and as we've gone out, God has worked in his own way, that he might have the glory, that his name might be honoured. 
You see, the work is his work. During this second lockdown that we're in, maybe you're finding things difficult, frustrated, you feel hemmed in, you can't do much. But brother or sister, you can pray. You can pray not just fleeting prayers, but constant prayers. Prayers for unconverted members of the family to be saved. Unconverted neighbours. Pray for Clan Trissant. Pray for Talbot Green. Pray for Bather. Pray for Wales. Pray for the United Kingdom. Pray for the world. Pray for missionaries. Pray your kingdom come. And then finally pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What are your prayers like? Do you and I pray like that? Or do we just pray about our present needs? Just about us? Or do we pray for God's glory? That's what these first three petitions are all about. The glory of God. Your name being hallowed, your kingdom come, your will being done on earth as it is in heaven. May the Lord help us to pray in that way. Now, what does it mean for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven? Perhaps you're thinking, well, that will only ever really happen when a new heaven and a new earth is established and God's will is done perfectly upon the earth. We can understand now that in heaven, the angels are doing God's will perfectly. They're doing his bidding everything that he asks them to do, all of his commands, he performs, they perform quickly, perfectly, completely. But we can't see how that can happen now. So surely Jesus is asking his disciples to pray for that time when the kingdom will come in all of its fullness and then God's will will be done perfectly as it is done in heaven. Well, yes, in part that's true. But surely the Lord Jesus is calling us to pray that his will will be done through our lives now. We may say, but that's only going to be imperfectly. And yes, it is very imperfect. But the, the standard is this. Be ye perfect, as my Father in heaven is perfect. Jesus is calling us to be holy as God is holy, to know God's will to do God's will. Yes, it'll be faltering, failing, but he says, here's the standard. Just as God's will is done in heaven, so you seek to do that will. You might say, well, how do we know the will of God? Brothers and sisters, we have the Bible. But yes, I don't understand the Bible very much. Well, ask God to reveal it to you. Ask him to open truth to you. Ask him to, to speak to you. He speaks through the word of God and by the Holy Spirit. And we pray, Lord, your will be done in my life. Your will be done in the life of my church, in the churches at large. May your will be done in us and through us and by us. Lord, we want to do your will. Whatever that means, we're to love you. And so, Lord, help us to keep your commandments. And we consider what those commandments are. Lord, yes, I want to do your will. You've told us to love one another. You've told us to love our enemies. You've told us to pray for those who persecute us. You've told us to pray for the persecuted church. You've told us so many things. Lord, may I perform your will in all of these areas by your grace. May I be submissive like the angels in heaven, like those spirits of just men who've been made perfect in glory, who are doing your will now and worshipping you. Help me, Lord, to completely, submissively, gladly do your will. Now, you may be dismayed by that statement by our Lord Jesus, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. But then I want to return you to this prayer. Jesus is saying this, pray your will be done because that's an acknowledgement that you're a failure. It's an acknowledgement that you cannot do it yourself. It's an acknowledgement that you need God to help you, that the Lord's will will be done. And notice in the Bible, there is no determinism and there is no fatalism. It's not, well, God is sovereign and he will perform his will, come what may, so it doesn't matter, we don't need to pray. 
Yes, God will perform his overall perfect will. But you know, he has made us free agents and he wants us to pray about ourselves and about the church and about God's people everywhere that we would fulfill his will. There's no fatalism. Jesus has said, the Bible says that God does work in us to will and to do according to his own good purpose. And that's the encouragement. We're to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, but to know that it's God who works in us to will and to do of his own good pleasure. So when we say, Lord, your, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we're acknowledging that his will will be performed in us by his grace. So to finish this day, we've considered the first three petitions about first of all his name, secondly his kingdom, thirdly his will. And that's how Jesus himself prayed. He prayed about the name of God. He said this in one of his prayers, Father, glorify your name. He prayed about the kingdom. In another prayer he said, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. I'm praying for those who will be converted. He prayed for God's kingdom to come. He prayed your will be done. He said this, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world would know that you sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. I'm praying that your will would be done, that they would love one another, they'd be united as, by, by my, as my people, and that the world would know that you have sent me by the unity that they express. Jesus taught us how to pray. He gave us the Lord's Prayer and he modelled it. May we use the Lord's Prayer to help us in our prayers. May we follow the example of the Lord Jesus who often withdrew to a quiet place. May we learn to delight ourselves in God. And may through prayer and through the word of God, not only our lives be strengthened, may, be, may, may many others be blessed through us. For his name's sake. Amen.